Hi, this lecture will be on the frame and also on the lens. Chapter 2. When I use the word frame, when we use the word frame, we're, also, we're talking about a noun and a verb. We're talking about a noun, the frame. It's actually the shape, the window in which we include our shot. And we're also talking about framing, meaning setting uh, the viewer's attention. Framing, just as we use it as an idiom in argument, we're framing an argument or we're framing the discussion. Uh, we're framing the story. And that's a good way to think about the frame. The frame is really not a static thing, but it is, it's, it's how we guide people's attention. It's one of the fundamental ways we guide people's attention. And there are different aspects and principles to using that frame um, that, um, that you can learn uh, right off the bat. It can help you uh, greatly. Just to take a step backwards to see this right, Previously, we were focusing on content, and, and, and in that way, we were looking at the outline and the script, uh, and um, that really focused on what was going to tell our story, or what our story was made of. Framing is about how we tell our story, how we present the what. I want to show you a sequence of frames um, that are the lead-in to Alfred Hitchcock's famous uh, shower scene in Psycho. I'm not going to show the gory part. We're just going to show the lead-in. It's for just a few frames. But it's a great way for us to sort of begin to um, fill that up with our heads, uh, fill that into our headspace so we can think about that. So what I'm going to show you, show you a still frame of a shot. Uh, and then I'm going to actually then reveal the actual um, screenplay uh, that was written. Uh, th that eventually resulted in this particular shot. So here's this first frame. Um, you can see uh, one of our main characters there. Uh, it's an interior shot seated at a desk and so on. And from the screenplay, it reads, In her cabin, Marion, wearing a glossy robe, is seated at the desk with pencil, paper, and bank book. And then there's a cut, and now we have another camera angle, and we see this. These are all pretty short shots, not very long. She is calculating the amount of the stolen money she spent and must replace. And then there's a cut, and then we're back to that same shot, and then it pans across the room and it follows her. And the screenplay says, She tears up the slip of paper and is about to toss it into the wastebasket, but thinks better of it and takes it into the bathroom. And then there's a cut, and then there's this shot. You just see the toilet seat and her hand off out of frame and the screenplay says where she flushes it down the toilet this shot then is wonderful extraordinary this is what Hitchcock is great at produced this this really startling um, spray radial of uh, water as she turns on the water and this is what Hitchcock is brilliant at he's sort of creating this jolt of visual electricity um, you know bad things are coming, um, uh, and extraordinary use of the frame, right? She turns on the shower. Then we get these shots, and you can see how well cropped they are. Things are, are really filled the entire frame, uh, and the screenplay says, As she is showering through the translucent shower curtain, we see the door open, a shadow slowly approaches. And then, of course, there's this dramatic action Boom, this happens, and the screenplay says, Then a hand swiftly throws open the curtain. Marion turns and sees the backlit figure of a woman with a large bread knife in her raised hands. And it's a really extraordinary thing. And now, this is what I want you to look at. These next three frames are really masterful use of framing. And I want you to know, these are not um, one continuous shot that's been zoomed in, but instead these are three separately shot uh, frames uh, so they're jump cuts, jig, 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 like that. So there's this shot, and then pretty quickly afterwards there's this shot, and then there's this shot. And the screenplay reads Marion Screams. Now, you know that there's also this whole, the more famous part of this whole sequence uh, happens right, right after this. Lots and lots of cutting and shots and details and stuff like that.
But that's enough to show you how evoked to you, how important framing is. So first, some terminology. It's really important for everybody to be kind of up to speed and uh, uh, fluent in using the basic terminology of framing, which has to do with frame size, shot size. So you can see here, this is roughly equivalent to what you have in your book, maybe a little different. The VLS, the very long shot, which includes, these are all shots that are uh, uh, have to do with in relation to a figure, but you can also translate this to objects and scenes. So a very long shot and a long shot and a medium long shot. And these shots are all sort of defined by a medium long shot sort of cuts somebody off at the thighs above the knees. A medium shot is usually starts at the waist. Uh, a medium close-up, a close-up. Uh, 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 what you're looking at when you look at me, this would be a medium close-up, and a close-up might be something more like this. Uh, and then a big close-up is even closer, and an extreme close-up might just frame one part of the body, the eye, the mouth, or uh, the hands or another part of the body. Very important. This is a, a really standardized sort of um, terminology uh, that works great in shorthand. So now I want to cover these three principles of framing. There, there are, there is more indicated in the book, but these are the three I want to cover with you in this lecture. You're responsible for all the stuff that's in the book. First is rule of thirds. Next, I'm going to touch on headroom and then uh, lead room. So the rule of thirds goes like this. You can take any frame and you can divide it up into uh, sections, equal sections uh, with vertical and horizontal lines, dividing the three equal sections uh, horizontally and three uh, uh, vertically and three equal sections hor horizontally. Uh, and the where those lines lie or where those lines intersect are potentially strongest points of compositional focus. Now, I, I want you to know that this is not uh, uh, written in stone. It's not an ironclad rule. But it's a very good principle that can help you a great deal uh, sometimes in composing your shot. Here's a photo, for example, that's uh, utilizing the rule of thirds. The woman's smile is right there at the intersection uh, of two lines. Here's a couple more examples of a woman. Uh, the, the crosshair is right on her uh, between her eyes or the prow of the boat in another intersection or the falcon aligned along one a vertical or the cityscape taking up a bottom uh, quadrant. All um, good solid uh, uh, compositions. You may even find that cameras uh, that you own now will actually have the ability to dial up these kinds of lines, the rule of thirds lines. They're so universal and so useful uh, as an overlay in your viewfinder. Another principle is the idea of headroom, and this is one that's really important because a lot of new students get this wrong. They, they, they don't grasp this concept fully, and the idea goes like this, is that when we are shooting people uh, and they're talking and they're in the, center, they're in the frame, um, one should um, cheat it so that the frame, so that um, the one-third line, the upper third line, sort of intersects where their eye line is. Now, a lot of students think to put the middle of the face in the center of the frame, and they'll tend to frame something more like this. And the problem is, is that it really doesn't look very attractive or powerful, and it doesn't have a lot of presence with the subject that's in the frame. So it is quite standard for us to frame more like this. So you can see how that plays out here in the various shots, a medium, a close-up, and a wide shot. Look space. Uh, the concept, the principle essentially says, depending upon which way your subject is looking, you would tend to give them more space the direction they're looking in. And it depends on how much in that angle they're looking. So if I'm looking straight at the camera, you may not give me any look space at all. If I'm a little bit, if I'm looking uh, 45 degrees off axis, you will give me some look space. And if I'm uh, looking 90 degrees off axis, you, uh, you would tend to give even more look space. Corresponding to that is another concept, which is lead room. And lead room has to do with movement through space. So you generally lead the frame. You give some room uh, depending upon uh, horizontal movement, left or right or up or down. So this woman is jogging on a beach. And here are some more examples of people in motion and lead room. 
I want to talk a little bit about the lens here, not get too technical. We will get technical in future chapters here, but I want to talk about the mechanics of framing and how important the lens is and some of the aspects that the lens brings into this issue. The two aspects of the lens that I care about right now, and there are more, uh, are the focal length and the focus. So the focal length has to do with how zoomed in or zoomed out, that's our kind of common terminology that we use, right, our colloquial terminology, with the lens. Now, there are fixed focal length lenses. Um, I'm going to talk more generally about using a zoom lens at this point because uh, much of the equipment that you'll initially work with will have a zoom lens. That means it has a variety of focal length possibilities. You can zoom in, uh, telephoto, or you can zoom out, or you can have a kind of something in the middle which we'll refer to as normal. So a zoomed out lens would be a wide angle, a lens at its wide angle focal length. Here's 18 millimeters, so you can see the number is relatively small compared to the normal focal length, which is about 55 with this lens, with this camera, and zoomed all the way in, telephoto would be 300 millimeters. So the higher the focal length number, the more zoomed in or telephoto it is. Here's an example. This is uh, from a simulator, an online simulator I'll point you to. There's a 52 millimeter normal lens, but you can change the focal length. Here we zoomed out to 18 millimeter, uh, which is a wide angle lens. The one other aspect I want to touch on uh, briefly here is the use of focus. And focus is one thing that requires um, uh, higher quality equipment. Um, Focus guides our attention, you know. Uh, the human mind is actually hardwired, the eye is hardwired to be attracted to those things that are in focus and to sort of uh, uh, neglect those things that are out of focus. This is a really base kind of human uh, physical fact. Um, so with cheaper uh, cameras, webcams, cameras that you might find in your phone and so on, there's not a lot of control over um, focus. Everything is in focus. And you would think that would be a good thing. And, and in some cases it is, is. But in, in when we're trying to guide people's attention in our story making, actually having a shallower depth of field, a more selective focus, is actually way more useful. Here's an example from uh, The Social Network where the Mark Zuck Zuckerberg character is out of focus and this lawyer uh, who is uh, 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 investigating him uh, is in focus. And then the over-the-shoulder shot, you can see how focus guides our attention and makes more poignant the actual subjective experience of these uh, people on screen. Here's a great example of a focus, a snap focus, where um, the Mark Zuckerberg character is out of focus, being grilled by the lawyer, and then snaps into focus. And that really creates an experience for the viewing, for the viewer. So that's focus and how it uh, affects us and the way that we use it expressively. In the, uh, in the next chapter, we'll talk a bit more about um, creating motion and depth and creating depth in the, the frame. Thanks.